everyone. Welcome back to Free Health Spotlight's YouTube channel. So today we are joined by Dr. Elizabeth Miller, who, among many other things, um, is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine for Pediatrics, Public Health, um, Clinical and Translational Science. So we're going to be talking to her today and asking her about her research and also about trauma-informed care and what that means for us as undergraduates hoping to become healthcare professionals. So again, Dr. Miller, thank you so much for having or for joining us today. It's such a joy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So we'll just start off kind of, I know you have a lot of different research projects you're involved in. Um, so how would you kind of describe your main research interests? And then how did you also um, sort of become interested in them? Yeah, so I think, you know, if I were to describe my work in a sentence, um, my um, research reflects a commitment to community partnerships and health equity with the goal of eliminating sexual and partner violence, gender-based violence uh, for children and young people um, in community settings and clinic-based settings. Um, and so that's really much of my focus and the work, you know, I do a range of projects, you know, which we can certainly talk about, but also guide community engagement for the University of Pittsburgh's Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Um, and so I'm really committed to centering community voices, community expertise, you know, strengths of our community members, um, and certainly, especially of young people, you know, in um, any of our research, as well as, um, you know, clinical interventions. So um, how did I get into this work? Um, it's an interesting story. I was born and raised in Japan and came to the U.S. for undergraduate and then grad school and medical school. Um, ended up doing a PhD in anthropology because I was really interested in social influences on health. And um, most importantly, my medical school was paying for a student to do the MD PhD in the social sciences. So they paid for the rest of medical school and all of graduate school. Um, and so, you know, I would not necessarily recommend this pathway for everybody, but it worked well for me. And it was in anthropology that I was exposed to critical theory, black feminist scholarship in particular, and, um, and community partner kind of approaches um, to doing research. And um, I was doing my, D, my PhD dissertation um, on the social dimensions of HIV in Japan. And um, about two weeks into starting my field work in 1992, the Japanese Ministry of Health and Welfare said, came out with their public health message, which was the reason there's so much new HIV in Japan is all the foreign women. And what they were referring to was the trafficking of adolescent girls and young adult women um, into Japan's sex industry. So I ended up actually writing a dissertation um, that focused on the erasure of gender-based violence in public health discourse, and in particular around HIV prevention. And um, came back to the US after that experience of doing my dissertation research, like really gung-ho about making gender-based violence a health issue, a health care issue, and um, it was in that context in the late 90s, while I was still doing my training, I trained in both pediatrics and adult medicine. And during that time, really did everything I could to learn from domestic violence and sexual assault victim service advocates about how to support survivors. And at the time, it seemed like such a good idea, right, to use the their public health paradigm that was so common with any sensitive health issue, which is to screen 
for domestic violence. And so we started like really obsessing about how to get healthcare providers to screen for domestic violence, ask the right question, you know, is it, are you safe in your relationship? Are you in an abusive relationship, right? Do you feel safe at home? Like what's the right question? What series of questions and getting this really embedded in the healthcare system. And at the time it felt like the right thing to do. And in the year 2000, I was just finishing my residency training and I was volunteering one night a week in a drop-in center, a clinic for young people, primarily unstably housed, unhoused young people and um, gang affiliated young people. And a 15 year old young person came in requesting a pregnancy test. The pregnancy test was negative. They didn't want to be pregnant and were not using any contraception. And um, at the time I like asked the adult domestic violence screening question, do you feel safe in your relationship? And this young person looked at me like, huh? And I was like, well, can you get your partner to use condoms? And uh, she said, well, sometimes. And I was like, you know, here's a bunch of condoms, you know, handed her a brown bag full of condoms and said, you know, it's important to talk to your partner about using condoms every time. And um, let me educate you on all of your birth control options. And she was very, very politely kind of nodded the way through this lecture. And, um, and I said, you know, when you're ready to decide what you want to do about birth control, come back and see me. Two weeks later, she was in our emergency room with a severe head injury, having been pushed down the stairs by her boyfriend. And it was this profoundly kind of earth shattering moment for me, right? I had written my dissertation on violence against women and girls. I'd spent all this time advocating for domestic violence screening. And it was like staring me in the face and I totally missed it. And the part that was so heart wrenching was because this young person did not disclose during the visit, she left certainly with a bag full of condoms, which probably ended up in the trash, right? Because what's the likelihood that she would have been able to negotiate condom use with this abusive partner? But it was also a partner, it turned out, who was trying to get her pregnant when she didn't want to be. And um, she left with no resources, no information, no sense, right, that I as a health professional could be a source of support and potentially offering harm reduction and safety strategies for her. And so, you know, 21 years, almost 22 years later, right, that story in many ways launched what has been a near obsession with trying to do this work differently. And I think what I didn't appreciate back in the 90s was that in fact screening was the wrong paradigm for approaching issues of trauma and violence, largely because I've never had a patient actually show up in clinic going, hi, Dr. Liz, I'm in an abusive relationship and I need help. In fact, you know, most of the time it's I'm coming in, you know, with a headache, with chronic pelvic pain, with stomach ache, with, you know, recurrent um, sleep problems um, and, and, you know, substance use and the like, right? And that there is such a, um, there's so many reasons that our patients don't want to share this information with us, whether it's fear of retaliation, fear of the consequences, right? Worry about a carceral response, the criminal justice kind of response where child protective services gets involved or law enforcement gets involved and um, the shame, the humiliation, the judgment, and the fact that our patients don't actually trust us, in particular, our patients who are minoritized and marginalized and have experienced layers and layers and layers of trauma and oppression. And, um, and so my commitment to health equity and social justice work is really trying to think about how we approach our patients, many of whom have been exposed to trauma and violence. And by that, I mean also, right, living in a country that has not in any way, shape or form acknowledged, right, that this country was founded um, on genocide and slavery. 
And so we're in, unable, right, all this pushback on teaching um, about systemic racism in schools, right, a bit, inability to challenge power and privilege in this country has meant that when our patients come into us as healers, right, we have an obligation to do our work differently. And um, I encourage all of you to read Sean Ginwright's work around healing-centered engagement that really lifts up strength-based approaches, um, but opportunities for healing and recovery and recognizing that trauma doesn't define us. Um, and also that our role as health professionals then is not focused on case identification and shaking a disclosure out of our patients, but much more towards the vital importance of saying, I see you and I am offering information to you. Whether you choose to share your story with me is up to you. There's no pressure. Your story is your own, right? And I'm offering this information in hopes that you will share it with others because we all need to create a safer community for each other. And that's a profoundly different way of doing our work. And, um, and that's really what the last two decades has been is building a research program in that space. Yeah, that story that you told, I know I heard it before at the fraternity event, but it's still so sad. And it makes me just think about how like they come in and you just ask them like a flow chart of questions. Like, did you say yes? No. Oh, he said no. Okay, well, that's it then. Like, it feels like I don't know how easy it would be for anybody to open up about something so personal, especially like you were talking about all the systemic racism and, and the minorities in medicine and all of that just adds an extra layer, I feel like like a shield. So kind of how should, so we're talking about trauma-informed care. So how does that, how do you approach a patient differently using a trauma-informed care method? Yeah, well, it's really interesting actually that you ask about trauma-informed care because I actually, because language matters so much, right? I have actually shifted my language from trauma-informed care to healing-centered engagement. Oh, I love that. You know, and the reason is that when you teach or attempt to educate health professionals about trauma-informed care, people get really stuck on the trauma. They're like, I need to be informed about the trauma. And I'm like, Actually, not really, right? You know, the 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 when a person, you know, at what age they experience sexual assault and from whom and so forth, right, is their story. And if they choose to trust us with that, we're super, super duper grateful, right? But extracting that information from a patient who is coming in for some kind of you know gynecologic concern, and that I can approach that visit by saying, have you had an exam like this before? What was helpful for you? Some of my patients like to listen to music. Some of my patients like to have me talk through what works best for you, right? And, um, and to have, you know, and say some people get really anxious around this. Where are you with this? Um, that is taking a much more in a healing centered and really trauma sensitive, right? It's not trauma informed. I don't need to be informed about what happened. I just assume with every one of my patients that I have a survivor, right, um, in front of me. And, um, and that universal approach to trauma sensitive practice, I think is really, you know, and you know, I have like just countless numbers of patients who are like, this was like, this was like the nicest exam I've ever had, or I just feel like I could tell you everything. And I say, to, you know, I say to my patients, like, no, don't tell me everything. Your story is your own, right? I will love you and care about you no matter what. And um, that, you know, that, that way in which we can actually build a relationship, right, with our patients that feel safe and sustained and supportive, you know, is just one of the most immense privileges of being um, in the health professions, and I should say in the healing profession. Yeah, I feel like that's very empowering, because I feel like these survivors have had a lot stripped away from them. So like giving them the power to be in control of their own story is just really amazing. So just, I'm a little bit curious. So how well would, do you think that this healing kind of centered engagement is implemented in the healthcare system overall? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. You know, I am, um, 
very, very fortunate to um, partner with a national violence prevention organization called Futures Without Violence. And we've been working together now for close to two decades. And, um, and so the design of healing centered engagement, you know, we really, really were so thoughtful about centering um, patients, survivors, clinicians, right, in the design of this work. And, you know, my role has been doing both the formative kind of qualitative research, but also the randomized clinical trials to show that this approach actually works, right? And when I say works, people are like, do you reduce violence? And I'm like, no. And I actually help these, you know, help our patients increase their awareness of sexual coercion, reproductive coercion, partner violence, right? So it increases knowledge, it increases knowledge of resources, increases confidence that you're gonna use safety strategies, increases use of those safety strategies, right? And interestingly, in our study with adolescents, we did actually reduce violence three months later um, because probably adolescent relationships are a little bit more fluid that when you start to recognize, huh, maybe this isn't quite so healthy, right? Um, that, that perhaps we are intervening. Um, but reducing violence is less the focus with healing-centered engagement, and it's much more, do you feel like you can get the resources you need, right? And do you feel like your provider knows how to help you? Those kinds of outcomes are absolutely, you know, absolutely critical. And um, so then your question about how are we disseminating this? How well is this working, right, to get out? And um, by working with a national violence prevention organization, this has allowed me to work on the national stage with a number of state domestic violence and sexual assault coalitions. And most recently, we have had funding from the Federal Bureau of Primary Health Care, which wow. is out of the health services um, Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, H-R-S-A. And um, they had actually several years ago made a strategic initiative around the integration of intimate partner violence into all of their offices and bureaus. And so um, had that sort of federal support to work with community health centers across the country on integrating a healing centered approach. And, you know, so we've been working steadily, steadily, steadily on state level changes, right, in policy, working at the health center level, working with domestic violence agencies, working on better partnership building. It's been extraordinary. Um, and, um, and then getting down to the level of clinicians, right, to be really comfortable with offering information in this way. Um, and um, being able to do it in a um, in a you know that that universal education right and empowerment approach um, is huge, and I can't remember when we um, when we met whether I shared some of the safety cards that we have developed yeah. in this process. Yeah. yeah. You did. And so those all are available for free through Futures Without Violence. And you know, there's some that have been designed for college students, some that have been designed for um, transgender, gender non-conforming, gender diverse people, and um, another specifically um, designed together with American Indian, Alaska Native um, women and advocates. And it's just you know, so you know, depending on the setting, right? We've designed different kinds of educational cards to really facilitate these conversations. Yeah, I love those cards because I feel like it really individualizes. I know we were talking before about how medicine was kind of centered around like the white privileged patient. And I feel like these cards really like play to the people who are always missing out, sort of the minorities always being stigmatized. So I really love that. And then for the last question, a lot of our audience, it's undergraduates, and a lot of them are considering a career in public health, but they're not exactly sure if that's what they want to do. Um, so do you have any advice for anyone thinking about being going into public health? So what advice do I have? I would say the more that you can engage in community service, the better. And doing so truly from the place of, I wanna learn how to 
be part of making structural and systemic change. So why do I say that? Um, I was recently interviewed um, about kind of why do I do what I do? And in addition to being very, very fortunate that I grew up in a home with a father who was quite the social justice warrior. And so every day I'd leave for school, he'd be like, do the right thing. That was like his mantra. And, um, but once I was like done with my training and was working in a community health center, I actually was mentored by a community organizer um, through work that we were doing together around addressing the heroin overdoses in our community. And this community organizer, her name is Kitty Bowman, amazing. And she basically took me under her wing and it was like, here's an upcoming town hall meeting. This is what I need you to say at the town hall meeting, right? Here's an upcoming school board meeting. This is how you manage with school boards. Here's like how we're gonna do this like next community organizing event. And, you know, with her guidance was able to get a clinic in our school district started in our high school oh, where wow. I was working. We were able to start a drop-in center for young people after school, set up a confidential clinic in the post office building. I mean, it was unbelievable. And all of that community health work, I did not learn in school. I learned specifically from doing and working in community, but also coming into it going, I know nothing and I need to learn, right? And yeah. um, having community members serve as my faculty, I think has been really one of the most important aspects um, of my training. And because of that, one of the things that I do now as a you know, more gray haired, bright senior professor um, is actually working um, to identify community members who are willing to serve in that teaching role for our trainees. So as a requirement in adolescent medicine, all of our trainees are actually assigned a community mentor to really guide them in terms of developing their scholarship and so forth. So wow, I love that. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's really trying to formalize, I think, all of that. So for each of you, I think really thinking about your work in community is an opportunity to learn, ask a lot of questions, and then seek out mentorship, right, of those who are doing health equity and social justice work. Um, I need all of you. <laughs> That's really good advice. Well, thank you again so much, Dr. Miller, for being with us today. This was really helpful and insightful. So thank you again so much. Absolutely, it was such a treat to be with you. Thanks so much.